from creepy hotels where the guest never left to forgotten asylums with broken pasts. Come join us as we explore some of the darker stories surrounding the United States. Put on your nightlight because we are about to dive into the creepy side of America. Welcome to the Creepy Side of America. I am Dan Kozlowski. Joining us as co-host on this evening's episode is Tanya Cleary. Tanya is a producer here at WNEP. Tanya, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this episode. Yeah, you were actually the one who found this guest coming up. I did. I tracked him down. I thought it was pretty cool looking, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. On tonight's episode, we have Christopher Bonney joining us, talking a little bit about the Cavalier Hotel in Virginia Beach. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Chris, we bring you on the show today because we're researching some local haunted attractions, some haunted locations throughout throughout the United States to try to start this Creepy Side of America podcast. And we came across a hotel that's kind of in your area, and we saw you did a few stories on it. Uh, the Cavalier? That's correct. The Cavalier Hotel is a um, wonderful grand O hotel, and like hotels everywhere, it's especially of its vintage, uh, every hotel has stories, and the Cavalier certainly has many. When it opened in 1927, the hotel industry called it the finest resort hotel in America. Um, and the original campus spread over 250 acres. Wow. It sits on, a, on, a, on what used to be a, a, um, a sand dune overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the original campus spread over 250 acres. In addition to 195 guest rooms, it had an indoor swimming pool, horse stables, a golf course, a yacht club, a full-service garage, a dream train depot, all kinds of recreational activities, and the most modern conveniences of its time. Um, in the years that followed, the Cavalier became the place to be seen. Um, through its front doors came people like F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, um, Bing Crosby, Betty Davis, Bob oh. Hope, Elizabeth Taylor, Judy Garland, and even Al Capone, mobster oh. from Chicago. Ten presidents have stayed there. Tommy Dorsey, Frank Sinatra, Rosemary Clooney, and other top entertainers stayed there when they performed at the hotel's beach club across the street. At one time, you could board the Cavalier Special train in Chicago and be delivered in comfort to the depot at the hotel's gate at the foot of the hill. All that glamour came to an abrupt end in World War II when the U.S. Navy took over the Cavalier for use as a radar training school. As you may know, our area, we're, we're here at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. We have one of, if not the largest, naval base in the world. Um, the Cavalier's indoor pool was drained and turned into a classroom. Some of the trainees had to sleep in the stables. So, the, the, you know, the, the, the government seized a lot of properties for those purposes during the war years. And the Cavalier returned to regular service after the war. By the 1960s, though, wear and tear were showing on the Cavalier. Um, this coastal climate can be unforgiving, especially to old brick buildings. The Cavalier's walls were leaky. Um, the infrastructure was, was wearing out. Uh, it had a steel infrastructure, but one of the things we found during the renovation is that some of the steel didn't even touch the ground anymore. There were three or four generations of heating systems. And through the years, the various plans were floated for modernizing the place. During the 1960s, I believe, it came in the ownership of a family that had become fabulously wealthy through the discovery of a very, very valuable kind of ore that was found on their property in a rural county in Virginia. But the family members didn't always get along. And the dispute, as it has become known, within that family became so fractious that it, and, and so ugly, to be honest, it, the, the legal papers for this case could be a nighttime drama. It fell to a federal judge who saw no other solution to the family dispute other than to sell the property. The, the purchasers thought they could restore this grand old hotel in two years for $40 million. Instead, the project ended up taking 
four years and costing more than $80 million. Um, today, it's a very spectacular place again, once again, a leading beach resort that welcomes guests to enjoy the same level of luxury and modern amenities that defined its early years. It's quite a grand place, and it was, as I say, it took a long time to be renovated. It was every, every day the, the, the engineers and the construction people who worked on this project told me a couple of things. One is that there was never a day that they didn't have a surprise. And two, that they could probably have built a brand, a completely new 100% reproduction of the whole hotel for less than half of what the renovation ended up costing. Um, the investors who, who took on this assignment um, once jokingly told me that their investment had become a philanthropy. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, there's something special, though, about having the original hotel back restored than having something totally it, 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 built new. Yeah, it's it's an amazing place, and the the it, during the late 1960s, as the old hotel was falling into disrepair, I mean, there when when I visited it during the renovation, there was one wing of guest rooms that had been closed off for so long that the building supervisor, the the, the maintenance supervisor, who had been there for 17 years, had never been in that wing. Oh wow. I mean, That's how crazy it got. Yeah. Um, and at the end, the only full-time employee was the guy who kept the lawn. So, and as you can imagine, a place this old has no shortage of stories. Um, yes. And, the, you know, the, some of the haunted stories go back to the, the very construction of the hotel. I mean, it took 13 months to build the Cavalier Hotel. No, that's, some that's people a scary thought. Look, <laughs> one second there. Yeah. How, how big do you think go the Cavalier ahead. Hotel is? you know how many rooms are in the ho actual hotel? It, it, it the original it originally had 195 rooms, um, and they were, to be honest, in 1927, people didn't spend a lot of time in their hotel rooms, and they they were small. Right. And those rooms, real those rooms, really did not meet the changing taste of American travelers as it got older. And every now and then, the family that owned it would renovate a few rooms or a wing here or a floor there. I mean, on, on some floors. The, you, depending on which room you were in, you might have control over the heat and air conditioning. You might not have it. You might have one or the other, but not both. It was it was a hodgepodge of mechanical systems. Um, and and in the end, in the current state, um, I think they have 93 rooms. Um, they've obviously enlarged the rooms, created very nice suites, um, so that there are a total of 93 rooms. Yeah, we are going to uh, post a link to that website so you can see pictures because you you really have to see this place. It's the only word you could use really is grand. That's it. It, it really it really is. It 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 managed to get onto the National Historic Register. Um, I believe it is still an, uh, a Marriott Autograph Hotel, which confers some sort of individuality and and specialness and luxury. It, it, and it, as I said earlier, it's, it's kind of where everything took place at one time. Um, it was, it is, and you know, it is still, it is now, now that it's reopened, a very popular place to dine, to go for the, you know, to, to go hang out with friends. Um, it has a main dining room on the dining room on the main floor. Um, and in, on the lower floor, the ba essentially the basement level, um, there's kind of a Rathskeller grill called the Hunt Room, um, which is kind of another cool place with a giant fireplace, which we'll come into our ghost discussion in a minute. Let's talk about some of the uh, the creepier things that this hotel is known for. Yeah, it's a, yeah the Cavalier is also, I, I approached it also as a bit of living history because not only of all the things that took place there and of the ghost stories that we'll talk about, but, but because also it, when it was built, it displaced a small collection of black residents, most of whom, many of whom ended up working for the hotel. And through the years, it was, you know, it was a place that, that did not welcome black or Jewish guests. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was a pretty snooty place in its day. Um, all that's history now, and it's it, you know it welcomes everybody. Yeah. Um, and so, but as you can imagine, this place has you know the stories. I and mean, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. um, a lot of people seized on the 13 months. Mm -hmm. Probably the and arguably the most famous 
ghost story of the Cavalier has to do with that the story of Adolf Coors, the founder of the Coors Beer Company. We did hear about um, that. Poor, yes. Yeah, this one seems like yeah, a very Adolf, interesting story. And like when you look at hotels of this age, or even any building for that matter, it seems like they all have some kind of dark, questionable past. And this sort of definitely fits that. Yes. I mean, Adolf Coors was, during the, in the late 1920s, in the lead-up to the Depression, um, Coors was suffering from influenza and depression, he had it, it, the brewery had been doing very well, but the, the growing urge, you know, grading impetus for prohibition meant that the, the brewery had to start making other products for a while. And Coors, was, as I said, was suffering from influenza and depression and had taken a suite at the Cavalier after his doctor in Colorado recommended that the ocean air would do him the some fresh good. air, yes. Yeah. So on the morning of the morning of June 5th, 1929, just after having had breakfast with his wife and daughter in the, in one of the hotel's main dining rooms, you know, they were outdoors on the terrace as it was. Coors excused himself from the table and returned upstairs to his suite. And well, we, we don't know for sure exactly what happened. What we do know is that within a few minutes after getting back to his suite. Adolf Kors, Adolf Kors fell to his desk from his sixth floor bedroom. Was there like was a, it an accident? Yeah, was there a balcony or anything? No, there's the, the there's the same way. Well, just there's a, a new window there now, but it's the same room that's there now. Um, it's just uh, no, to the outside. It, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. It is also said that, and you were looking for other interesting stories. It's also said, although I not confirmed it, that. He had also come to Virginia Beach because he wanted to have a consultation with the famous psychic Edgar Casey, who happened to also live in Virginia Beach and had built a hospital in Virginia Beach. Uh, but anyway, That's we don't know if it was an accident, a suicide or a murder. I mean, nobody really knows. But what has happened is that since then, people who don't even know the core story have sworn they've seen a body falling from the sixth floor window where his room was. And some have even said they've heard the sound of a body smacking against the ground floor patio. And oh. near the window he went out of, cold spots are regularly reported by the staff and by guests in the room. Do people, it's, quite, it's quite the story. Do people tend to, or are some people ask specifically to have that room? You know what I mean? To see if they have any experiences? It, it, as far as I know... Um, that hasn't been the case um, since since I wrote the piece about the the ghost. There are people who have come to the hotel and asked to see the room. Um, it's actually a very nice suite now. Um, it, it, you know, although the windows are still in the same place, um, there is there are no remnants. And and that's also the kind of thing as they say. You know, people do people go to hotels and do strange things. I, I spent most of my high school and college years working in hotels in the, in the resort area. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, hotels are kind of neutral places where, where strange dramas get worked out. So, it's, you know, we don't really know the whole cool, core story, but we know that he went upstairs. The next thing you knew, he was, he'd fallen out of a window and fallen six floors to his death. Um, and just the fact that so that room he, is still able to be occupied by anyone. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very nice. Yeah. yeah. And there's no indication in that room of what took place there. The yeah. hallways of the hotel now are lined with photographs of some of the famous people who stayed at the hotel. Um, I, I don't recall whether there is one of a, a picture of Adolf Kors anywhere. Um, another, because of many great performers of the 20s and 30s used the piano in the grand ballroom of the Cavalier. The Cavalier had two quite grand ballrooms. When I was a child, you would go to a cotillion there or something. Um, and from time to time, people still hear a piano in that ballroom playing itself, as if some of those performers are mm. trying to bake, bring back some of the joy and merriment of the, of the jazz age. Um, and that's pretty spooky, i got to say, if you see that yeah. big room and, and th there's nobody in there. I mean, at the Cavalier, even the elevators have stories until relatively modern times, the, the Cavaliers' elevators had operators. I mean, there was a yeah. man, or generally a man, who stood there and took you up and down. Right. Uh, but during but during times when the hotel was closed, 
um, or was just opening for the season, workers in the building would report that the elevators were running by themselves with no one in them, no one to run them. The elevators would go up and down from floor to floor and with, with no quite rhythm in mind. Right, and especially in that time, it needed that operator to initiate the process right. of going up or down, right? Right, exactly. I mean, I don't think they had, you know, self-operated, self-operated elevators in that building until, well, well into the 1970s. Right. Um, so, you know, what was going on there? Nobody quite knew. Uh, the sixth floor of the hotel, the, the hotel has seven floors. The sixth floor seems to be the nexus of a lot of the ghost stories. Um, Cores having been the most famous, perhaps. But for many years, especially during the winter, when there might not be any guests in the hotel, the hotel's receptionist working the late shift would get phone calls from rooms on the sixth floor. Now, that mm-hmm. wouldn't be unusual. I mean, if, if in those days, you had a switchboard, so you knew where yeah. all the calls were coming from. That would be routine if there were guests staying in the hotel. But it's a little spooky when they're coming in from an empty room on an empty floor of yeah, an empty sure. hotel. Of course, when they answered the phone, there was nobody there. There was no sound. And if they sent a bellman up to check things out, they would find there was nobody on the sixth floor. Do you know of anyone who ever quit because of things like this happening? No, not that I know of. Although he's recently passed away, there was one employee who started as a bellman, ended up as the, the greeter at the front door, a man named Carlos Wilson, had worked for the hotel for good 55 years. He ran a tight ship and made sure that the staff was always very attentive. And to work at the hotel was a very prestigious job Mm -hmm. because it it tended to attract um, affluent visitors who tipped well. And remember in those, in those early days before, you know, before the, for people who didn't take the train, people frequently came to the Cavalier with a chauffeur and a maid. And the hotel had a separate building down the hill from the main hotel where those people could stay. Um, and so I don't know that it, anyone ever left, um, but I, I think a lot of people, it's safe to say a lot of people were spooked by it. Yeah, um, right, of course. And there was, yeah, there's more than just the hauntings of the, the silent phone calls and the piano that plays itself. Another sixth floor ghost spotted over the years by both employees and guests is an old man dressed in a World War I vintage military uniform He's seen standing near a, stay, a staircase on the sixth floor, warning people that there are ghosts on that floor. What? So a I, ghost, I, I, a ghost yeah. warning about ghosts. Yeah. I've never heard that. Right, right. And does he's, he know he's, he's a ghost? In a uni- well, they, they, you know, he sort of appears to people as somebody you can sort of see through. Um, it's you know, it's like on television. It's it's kind of the classic concept yeah. of what a ghost might be. Has, uh, has anyone ever been up to that sixth floor to do any sort of, I mean, I know it's frowned upon, but seances or anything like that, or, tr- or you know, local mediums or anything, tried to contact any of the spirits a, up there? A few, year, a, few, a few years before the hotel closed for the renovation, there was a gathering of sort of ghost studiers, if you will, who came and held a weekend gathering there. I've never heard anything of whether they they found anything or it's like Ghostbusters, whether they found any unusual powers or mm-hmm. or things there. But, the, you know, the people who've experienced these things are pretty darn sure. Now, the, the next thing I'm going to tell you about, I've actually seen the evidence of this, although I'm not I never saw the ghost. This is the, the story of the woman and her dog and what is now the hotel's main dining room. There is a pale woman who shows up occasionally looking to dine. She's dressed in clothing of another era. She has no reservations. And sometimes she's admitted, sometimes there's no room or whatever. But it's been reported. I've never seen this, but I've talked to people who have. It's been reported that she walks through the dining room with a ghostly dog at her side. Hmm. And yeah, that's that, very strange. Somebody. Yeah, yeah. And, and while we're on pets, there's the story of the little girl and her cat. Over the years, many workers and guests have reported seeing both a ghost girl and a phantom cat at the hotel. It's believed that the little girl was staying with her family at the hotel back in the early 1940s when the cat got out of her room and made its way downstairs. 
Some believe the cat fell into the indoor swimming pool, and when the little girl jumped in to save it, they both drowned. <sighs> now, what what has come since is that the cat has a cat is heard mewing or meowing mm-hmm. and scratching at doors, maybe looking for the little girl. Now, paw prints are there are some paw prints in the paint on the steps of a back service staircase. I've seen those. Oh, you've and seen the paw prints yourself. I've seen the paw prints myself. Now, whether they're the ghost or whether somebody came along and did that, I can't testify. But but some people have reported seeing the cat walking through the walls. The hotel's concession to that story is that in honor of the phantom cat, the hunt room, grill room, now has a drink called the ghost cat. <laughs> well, at least they like to embrace their creepy past. Sure. Good sure. For them. Now, finally, the, the last one, and one of my favorites, has to do with what came to be known as the missing Watergate tape. Among the presidents who stayed at the Cavalier was Richard Nixon. Um, Older listeners will recall that Nixon was famous for making tape recordings of all the meetings that took place in the Oval Office at the White House. In fact, some of the most... (laughs) Some of the most compelling evidence of Nixon's impeachment trial came from those tapes. Yep. At one time in the early 70s, Nixon's oldest daughter, Julie, had married David Eisenhower, who was in the U.S. Navy, and he was stationed here at the naval base in Norfolk for a while. And, and at one point, the Nixons, just as things were really heating up at the Watergate impeachment, the Nixons came down and, to visit Julie and David, um, and it said that Nixon managed to get to bring one of those old incriminating tapes and destroyed it by throwing it into the majestic fireplace that's in the hunt room dining room at the Cavalier. That's, um, hmm. you know, I, I, yeah, that seems a little far-fetched to me, but, the, but that's another one of those stories that goes around. And we know Nixon was there. We know he was in Virginia Beach about the time of the, of the hearings and the impeachment. And so who knows? But, I mean, you know, you start with Adolf Kors, and you end with Richard Nixon and a Watergate tape. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I don't have a picture I can send you right away, but the fireplace down at the hunt room, is a, it was on the lower level of the hotel. It was, it was kind of a hit place to hang out because it wasn't as formal as the rest of the hotel. And it, in, in, the, in the, the decor of the day, it had a lot of hunting scenes, and the motif was very much about outdoorsy hunting and fishing, but in a very classy way. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, the the real showcase of that dining room downstairs was this is is to this day this magnificent fireplace that it's it's you couldn't drive a car into it, but it's just about that big. Yeah. And during the renovation, uh, what made the renovation of the Cavalier possible? was that it qualified for a, a bucket load of historic preservation benefits. But that also meant that it had to meet very high standards of historic preservation. All of the, all of the hotel guest rooms, for example, had to, the, the doors had to be used in some way because they were the original doors. But none of the doors met current ADA standards. So they found ways to use them and other things. The door handles, um, in some of it became that the handles became towel racks in the bathrooms. The doors became closet doors in the guest rooms. When it came to the fireplace down in the hunt room, which was one of just several fireplaces in the, in the big lounges and public rooms of the hotel, um, one, it was in serious, it was, it was seriously in danger of falling down. Um, as you may have seen in the pictures, the hotel has kind of a bell tower on the top yeah. that when the hotel was built, had a huge water tank in it that provided fresh salt water to the guest rooms. There were three knobs, a hot water knob, a a faucet, a a cold water faucet, and a salt water faucet. And the tank held water. Wait, why would people want salt water? Well, it was considered restorative. Uh, Remember, this is the 20s. For health reasons, I believe, back in the 20s. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, And at one point during the renovation, the construction supervisor told me that he had, I mean, this is when the project was well a year overdue, and every day there was a new surprise that cost a lot of money, and they didn't know if it would ever get done. But one day he said he had to call every bit of, every worker, and I mean, there were hundreds of people working there. I mean, stuff had to be meticulously restored, uh, balustrades on the roof, windows, the brick on the building, 
I mean, you asked earlier whether someone had 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 seen or had done any sort of scientific study. By the time the renovation came along, all of the guest room floors were gutted completely from the exterior brick on one side to the exterior brick on the other side um, because everything in between was in was falling down. And even the brick was so porous that if it rained on it, you could count on the rain coming through the brick. Yeah, uh, yeah. It took a lot of work to do that. Um, but that one particular day, he told me, they realized that the whole bell tower and the six, seven floors below it were getting ready to fall right down through the center of the building. And that precipitated a whole lot of new engineering studies, a whole lot of more steel. And, and the problem was solved. But uh, as I say, this was a labor of love for everyone involved in it. Well, I'm, um, I'm it, happy it was, that it's still, I mean, it's still standing. It's beautiful. Now I can, I can understand it, why it, ghosts it, don't it, want to it, leave. Yeah, it, it, it's very beautiful. I mean, it, it, it is a throwback, but it also, I mean, it has all the most modern amenities and um, the guests have the use of the hotel, of the indoor pool. The, the, there was back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, of a really popular beach club across the street, which was belonged to the hotel, which had cabanas. And I mean, I grew up hanging out on weekends there when my parents bunny hopped and fox trotted across the oceanfront dance floor. <laughs> um, and when they built the, when they did the renovation, that, that, that building too was just kind of hanging on. A flood in the early 60s had pretty much demolished it, a, a freakish nor'easter storm that flooded much of Virginia Beach. Um, but they built a smaller beach club there that is available to the hotel guests and to the people who bought homes on the, the campus surrounding the hotel. And I know when you're talking about all this renovation that happened at a hotel over the years, I know a lot of times people say that sort of sparks up a lot of paranormal activity. So that could be some explanation mm -hmm. of all the things that are happening there. By, by all means, as I say, that was that one south wing on, I think, the, the fifth floor that was closed up so long that nobody had been in it. Who knows what was in there? And who know, I mean, as I said, it's, it's, one of, it's a classic case of if these walls could talk. It definitely sounds like a very nice hotel, and I definitely like the actual creepy touch of the past there. It has some very interesting sure. stories surrounding it, that's for sure. I know where I'm going when I go to Virginia Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I created that Facebook page, I was really just trying to see, one, whether we could use social media to rally some public support for this. Right. Um, and what that became was a wonderful place for people with old people, young people, anyone who had some contact or some history with the hotel came out of the woodwork with all kinds of stories of how the hotel had played a part in their lives. Definitely seems like it was a main part of the Virginia Beach area, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And hopefully it's there for many years to come after all that restoration. Yeah. I wish I owned that building. <laughs> it is a very cool building. Chris, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight on the show. Yes, you had a lot of you. great information about the hotel. And to be honest with you, that's the first time I heard of a story of a ghost warning people that ghosts are on that one floor. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it must be pretty, it must, there must be a lot of spirits in that place when they're looking out for each other and trying to keep you from running afoul with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Thanks well, again for joining us. You. Have a nice evening. Yep, you, you too. too. It's fun. Take care. Stay spooky. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Thank you for listening tonight, and thank you, Tanya, for co-hosting tonight's episode. It was a pleasure. Until next time, enjoy the creepy side of America. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the creepy side of America. If you have any ideas or topic suggestions for an upcoming episode, send them to ghost at WNEP.com. We're dying to hear from you. Ha, 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 ha.